Right, so a recent survey of over 4,700 TFS viewers revealed that 87% of you have less than a few hours of welding experience or TIG welding training. So, uh, and even half of that, half of that 87% have none. So this is a very bare bones, very first welds you're ever going to lay down in fine, extremely detailed TFS fashion. This is months of what you would experience encompassed in 240 some odd minutes here. So make sure you leave me a like if you liked it, smash the thumbs up, share it with your people. Drop a comment down below if you want to learn more, whatever the case is. Uh, remember that we've got classes, we've got everything else. So back to my garage in this style right here. Nothing fancy, just straight up friggin' welding. Good luck to you. Hope to see you on the other end of this video. Your first TIG welds are going to be really, really tricky. And not really because it's that hard or that difficult to do, but it's all the stuff that you should know about before you actually sit down and do this. So that's what we're going to really aim in on this one and really hone in on is what you should be doing or what to expect. So the first thing that we really need to talk about is your work surface. You need something that is obviously metal that will you know conduct electricity right you need something that'll that'll hold your work that you're working on it right it should be at a comfortable height now comfortable is a tricky term because there's nobody in this entire world that can tell you what's comfortable and if you've ever watched anybody else's videos they're like get comfortable sit like this that's that may not be comfortable for you now i understand that it's relatively tricky to figure out what comfortable is when you've never done it because theoretically everything new is kind of uncomfortable, like holding a torch or sitting in a chair, or whatever the case is. But let me just try to help you out this way. There is nothing in the rule books of welding that says you have to be squared up to your metal, right? You don't have to be sitting here like this with absolutely perfect posture. You don't have to do any of that. You don't have to, you know, make sure you're looking over the top of it. You don't, you don't have to be posed in a certain way. This is not like sipping tea or anything like that. There's no etiquette to welding, right? The idea here is that no matter what it is that you find is comfortable. If you're hunched over, slouched like this, and the only way you can see it is if it's in front of your face and that's comfortable, do it. If you have to have this gnarly ass gangsta lean and you can weld from way back here and that's comfortable, do it. If you have to be like shrunken in your chair and on the edge of your bench, if that's comfortable, do it. Now we've taught 600 plus people one-on-one -on -one in our classes how to weld. And I've seen everything from, you know, people slouching across the table like this to one time I even had a, uh, an oral surgeon that used to work on the uh, corner of the desk or on the, on the table, literally like he was in somebody's jaw and that was what was comfortable for him. So we didn't fight that. We said, hey, that's exactly what you need to do because that's what's comfortable to him. So the first and foremost, the most important thing, take some time before you even flip the machine on to get find a comfortable position, right? Sit there and be like, yeah, that's pretty cool. The only couple things you really need to pay attention to is one, when you're welding, can you see the tip of the tungsten? And you have line of sight. You need to have line of sight on the very tip of that tungsten so that way you can gauge the height of it and you need motion. The second thing is you need to not be stiff. You need to be relaxed. You need to be, you know, if you have to slouch, go for it. You know, sometimes I'll even put a leg up on the table just to be like, hey, this is, this is comfortable for me. It's a very relaxing thing. So whatever it is, make sure that one, you can see your part and your, the tip of your tungsten and pretty much the whole line of sight along the part that you're gonna be running. So if you're only gonna run a four inch coupon, make sure you have four inches worth of line of sight to where you can see the tip of the tungsten the entire way through. Second thing is find that comfortable spot. Be slouched. If you're tense, you're not comfortable, right? If you can't naturally move or flow in any direction, you're not comfortable. So take some time and find that spot. Figure out what's comfortable for you. So let's, let's talk about this torch for a minute, right? Because I mean, this is actually really tricky to do. And especially if you've never actually done this before, I mean, obviously it's not gonna be comfortable. Like how do I hold a torch, right? I don't, that doesn't feel right. Well, we'll try to make it feel right here, okay? First and foremost, get your gear on, get your gloves on. We're not, we don't have the machine on or anything else like that, right? Make sure that your lead, which is the whole line for the torch, make sure that it's not, you know, all bunched up like this. It's not, you know, in knots or anything else like that. You know, it's gotta be kind of straight flowing, right? You take that, throw it on the floor, grab some slack, right? And just throw it in your lap. Ideally, you want the, the lead, the slack of the lead to not pull off your lap. So get it in a spot there and you need to have enough left over to where it's not gonna pull the torch out of your hand. So we're trying to balance out gravity here. You'll, you'll find where that spot is, right? So just take that, that slack a little bit. I mean, what is it like this much here? Just toss that in your lap and the rest of it can come up to your hand. 
So that's kind of what we're looking for. Just, just have it there. It's not going to electrocute you or anything else like that. You're not going to be in this field of magnetic radiation, none of that crap, right? Don't worry about that. So ideally what we're looking to do is find that comfortable position, that balanced point. This section between your thumb and your index finger right there is called a perlicue. And this backside of your thumb here, that's kind of what we're aiming for. What we want to do is have your hand out, kind of like you're going to shake somebody's hand. Just put your hand straight out like this and set the torch on top of it. What we're ultimately aiming to do is find that center of mass of that torch, okay, to where it will balance. If you just take it and set it here, notice it's all free floating. No matter where I'm at, no matter how I move, the torch is balanced, right? It's comfortable, or it's, I would say that this is comfortable, but maybe for some it's not. But either way, this is a natural position where you can balance it. This is not a trick. This is not like a, I'm a welder and that's cool or whatever, right? This is literally a balanced point. So find that point where it's balanced and it's just sitting freely. It's, it's, it's on its center of mass. It's not falling forward. It's not falling backwards. It's not at risk of slipping off your hand. None of that. Just set it right there. Okay. Now take your middle finger and your index finger and just put it around the neck. I want to say it's kind of like, uh, you know, holding a cigar or whatever the case is, right? But it's just around the neck there, right? This should not have any kind of serious tension in your fingers. It should just be kind of relaxed, right? We're just going to set it there. The torch can go somewhere over here, right? Now, ideally, you don't want your fingers to be too close to that cup because you'll end up getting burned. Like, there's no other way around it. You're talking like 3,000 some odd degree metal and your, you know, fingers are inches from it. We don't want that. So make sure you have enough clearance, if you will, to where you can not get burned, right? It's really that simple. So with this relaxed kind of grip, right? The torch, we're not death gripping it. We're not like, I am welder, you know? Because if you're, if you're death gripping it, if you're blotchy, I mean, you can't move. That's, that's a sign of tension. If you have a shaky hand, like you're sitting here like this, I know a lot of people have natural tremors and I'm not making fun of them, but you gotta find a way to get rid of that. I mean, not really, maybe you can't, but if you're not normally shaky or whatever the case is, then you gotta find that position to where you're not because that shakiness is usually a sign of tension somewhere in your body. So you gotta take the time to figure out where that's at. This hand should just be flowing freely. I mean, people have made fun of me because I gesture when I talk a lot, but think about it that way. If I have this in my hand and it's just there like an accessory, that means that it's balanced. I can do whatever I want with it while it's here, right? That's, to me, that's indicating that it's a comfortable position. And a well-balanced torch, that's kind of where we want. Now, years ago, I did make a video about different ways to hold the torch and everything else like that, but we're not gonna worry about it. The only thing you really need to concentrate on is, is that torch balanced and in a relatively comfortable position. You can have your palm down, you can have your palm to its side, you can, you, know, you can go like this or whatever the case is, and some people, they succeed with that. And I encourage you to try it all out, but ideally we're looking for that nice balanced point where I can just grab it and all of the motion or all of the movement of my part or when I make my weld is nothing but my fingertips. Maybe a little bit in my wrist, but not in my arms, not in my body, not in my core, not being all tensed and jacked up, you know, one of those things. It's super relaxing and soothing, right? So fluid comfortable, tiny amounts of motion, right? And no, if you're burning yourself, stop. You're doing something wrong. I'll just tell you that when I watch people burn their freaking fingers off, they're like, wow, that's getting hot. And they just keep on welding. It's like, no, don't do that. Just freaking, you know, fix it. <laughs> Hopefully that helps you out. Let's talk about the foot pedal. All right, now the foot pedal. This is your on switch. This is your off switch. This is your complete control of that machine. Every single bit that you step on this, every single bit that you change this, every single bit that you go to that first point where you can just hear it, let's see if I can get it on the microphone. Hear that click? That's the on switch, that's telling the machine, let's fire up and go. So that's your on switch, and then of course once it's lit, you increase to increase your amperage. Amperage meaning the uh, amount of energy that's going into the part. Not to be confused with heat, because I've said before that heat is time. So it doesn't matter how many amps you have, the longer you sit in one spot, the hotter it's gonna get. And you'll see that as we, as we go into this lesson here and everything else like that. But just remember that just like a car, you know, you can almost think of it this way. So you step on it, you're gonna go faster. You let off of it, you're gonna go slower or you're gonna decelerate. It's kind of like that in welding, provided that you have the correct discipline to do that and to keep up with it. So we're, of course, we're gonna explain that, right? But just remember that every single bit of that machine is controlled right here at your foot. It doesn't matter where 
or what foot it's attached to working on. It doesn't matter where the pedal is positioned, right? You can have it directly below you. You can have it on your knee. At some points in time when I've been doing chassis work, I tape the thing to my foot and stick my foot like up in the friggin' A pillar or a B pillar or something just to give me a surface, right? So it doesn't matter where the pedal is actually positioned. As long as you can access it and you have full range of motion on it, that's effectively all we need. Left foot, right foot, doesn't matter as long as it feels right to you. And remember that every single thing of this machine is controlled by this foot pedal. So if your torch gets stuck, you take your foot off the pedal, right? You don't lift the torch out or whatever the case is, you just take your foot off the pedal. If you want to weld, you put your foot on the pedal and you get moving. But it's best practice that when you're not welding to completely remove your foot from the foot pedal. Okay, so I feel I owe you guys a bit more of an explanation. This is our earth lead, our ground clamp. We're gonna take this and we're gonna throw that very, very far away, okay? It is not connected to this table right now. And that's for very, very important reasons. Now, the ghost in the machine, that buzzing sound, that, that strange light that you can see when you look into some machines, you'll actually see this blue light flashing across that. What is that? That is called the high frequency start. Let's just see how this works here. Watch carefully. We're gonna slowly step on the pedal till we hit that switch. Oh, there it is. What is that buzzing sound? All right, let's, here, let's, let's show off a little bit, right? Okay, that is high frequency start. What that basically is, is the machine is trying to complete a circuit to actually start welding, okay? In other words, this little bolts of lightning that you see coming off of here, and that buzzing sound, what that's effectively, that's a high voltage, low amperage, as in that's a lot of electricity, but not enough to kill you, right? There's not enough current in there to kill you or to zap you to make you really sting really, really bad. Okay, so what that's basically trying to do is complete the circuit. So that's gonna start the arc and the arc is a high amperage, low voltage circuit that will kill you. Or if you're lucky enough to wake up from the zap of it, you're, you're, you're gonna sting, it's, gonna, it's really gonna sting. So. Uh, here's what the thing is. If you hear that sound and you're not ready to weld, take your foot off the pedal. Just completely remove it. And that's why I said that just a few minutes ago, remove your foot from the pedal completely when you're not welding. And when you're ready to weld and the torch is in place and you're ready to fire, then you can put your foot on the pedal. So again, take your foot off the pedal because that's, that's the dangerous side there. Especially if it connects, if it creates that circuit, you're going to get zapped, you're going to get electrocuted. It may end up killing you. It rarely ever happens, but you know, it just, just take your foot off the pedal, right? Hopefully I've made that very, very clear. That's the sound, that's the, that's the ghost in the machine, whatever the case is, right? So just take your foot off the pedal until you're ready to weld. And when you're done welding, remove your foot completely. Simple as that. I think I have beaten this horse into the ground. Let's, let's do some welding. This is a welding coupon. This is from weldmetalsonline.com. This is an eighth inch aluminum coupon. We're gonna start with aluminum because everybody loves welding aluminum. And of course our class coming up, our first Weld With Me Live is gonna be all about aluminum. Now, here's the thing. Let's get ourselves into position. My foot is not on that pedal. My torch is slacked, right? It's balanced on my hand. Let's see if I can get this to my, my perfect grip. There we go. Oh, almost had it. So we're balanced, we're good, we're comfy, we're nice. I've got my grip. I'm comfortable at the table here. I'm kind of slouched, whatever the case is. Both my arms are resting on this. All of my movement's in my hands right now, but we're not even gonna move. All we're gonna do is light this sucker up and see exactly what happens. Now, the counterintuitive part, if you have ever welded before, if you've oxy welded, if you've MIG welded, either one of those two, this is the part that's gonna suck or it's gonna be hard to understand, but you gotta stick this in your head as fast as possible. The closer you are on TIG welding, the closer you are to your metal, the cooler it stays. That means if you pick the torch up, it's gonna get hotter. And when I say that's counterintuitive, because oxyacetylene, for example, the closer you are, the hotter it gets, and you pick it up to relieve some of that heat, to cool it off, right? If you do that in TIG welding, it's literally only going to get hotter. You're also going to lose definition of your weld pool because the arc is splayed out so far that it's, it's literally trying to heat up an area like this big instead of this little tiny section right in front of you. So remember, the closer you are, the cooler it gets. The same rule applies in MIG welding, but it appears differently. That's just some science, right? But never, ever, 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 never, ever pick up the torch. Never pick up the torch. Keep it as close as possible without touching. 
And how close is close or too close? Too close is touching. If you're a 16th of an inch or like 1.6 millimeters, you're technically considered too high unless you can really control that. Anything above that, forget it, right? So you wanna keep it as close as possible without touching. Obviously, you gotta be kinda of relaxed or whatever the case is. So let's, uh, let's drop this hood here and let's see what happens when we start initiating this arc, right? I'm gonna fire off, I'm relatively close, right? But let's drop this and see what's going on. So I initiate, and you hear all that sparkling, that nasty, unfocused arc. That's not enough amps to keep this lit. So we're gonna increase slightly by stepping on the foot pedal, and immediately I see a bunch of ashy stuff. That ashy stuff is the oxide layer being broken up. If I increase my amps, I'm gonna start seeing little dots, little speckles. That's the oxide layer breaking up and the aluminum below it trying to get molten. If I increase more by stepping on the pedal, I'm gonna see the formation of a shiny spot in the middle of it. That's not the weld pool yet. So let's increase more and you see it start to form and centralize and then it's reflective. As soon as it's shiny and reflective, that's a weld pool, okay? Now I'm take my foot completely off the pedal and then I can move my torch, right? That's the hard part. That's what everybody never really realizes that that shiny reflective spot, not the shiny spot, but the reflective spot, that is the molten aluminum. That's what we want, right? Now anything before that, you know, that's, you can't weld with that, right? Ideally, what we wanna do is form a weld pool. That's the purpose of this exercise right here. So quarter inch in diameter or about six millimeters, that's what you want. Right, so what we wanna do is build that weld pool until that reflective spot is about a quarter inch or six millimeters, six millimeters in diameter. That's, that's the purpose of this, this exercise. So I'm gonna move right next to it and we're gonna fire again. This time a little bit quicker. So there's the dots, there's the shiny spot, there's my reflective weld pool, quarter inch, get out of it. When I say get out of it, I mean bring your foot off the pedal. You don't have to, you don't have to be like, you know, if the, if the pedal's thumping around and like bouncing off the floor, then you're a little bit too aggressive on it. You can ramp off of it, right? And you'll see the difference as you, as you go through this, you'll see that, okay, it's solidifying now. You'll find the speed. You'll find the speed after this exercise because we're gonna fill this whole thing up here. So let's try to go in a little bit quicker. Quarter inch right there. That was pretty quick, right? That's about how fast I work. Actually, I usually have more amps on the machine, but that's irrelevant. So let's just make a bunch of little dots. That's pretty good there. Once I have that under control, I can move on. But I should say, here's one thing I see a lot. This hand is gonna eventually hold filler, so make sure that it's at the ready, right? As in, in this general area. We're not using it to brace our hand, or our torch hand. This is not MIG welding. It's, it shouldn't be uh, you know, underneath you like this, right? Because it's gonna have to be on the table anyway. Might as well have it there, or get used to it being in this general area, right? Don't want it tensed up either, right? We're, we, we're super loose when we're doing this. So just remember, relax, and everything that we see in front of us is a direct result of what our foot is doing. So that's the connection here, right? When you see that weld pool form, that's because you made it do that, right? So let's show you what a couple of runaways look like. So this one here in the center is our control. So again, quarter inch or six millimeters in diameter, decent sized etching zone, right? Not too bad. Then we went over to getting way too big here, right? Our torch height was sky high, which means this whole area right here is the molten weld pool or was. You see there's oxides forming, all kinds of other nasty stuff. That's not good. We definitely don't want that. So keep the torch as close as possible without touching. Now this is touching, right? So we only went in there for a brief moment in time and went Zzz. There's actually molten tungsten, or there's a piece of tungsten stuck in that weld pool right there. So again, if you ever touch or it cuts out or whatever the case is, just take your foot off the pedal. That's all you gotta do. Then we went over to here, it's contaminated tungsten. Now this weld pool is the same size as this weld pool, but the arc was splaying outward because we lost the definition or the, the grind angle on our tungsten. It basically screwed it up. So it splayed outward and we get this uh, little bit of a ring around the outside here, but the etching zone is a lot wider because the arc was splaying out. It also kind of stirred the puddle a little bit. It was, you know, to an untrained eye, that's kind of hard to see, but it kind of stirred up the puddle a little bit, leaving us with little to no definition. You can see it's not as nice and as round that's because the uh, tungsten was deformed. So if we 
if we you know follow the discipline and actually take the sucker out change it out with a sharp one or clean it up or whatever the case is then we wouldn't have these little issues right then we go over to having too much angle on it now <laughs> again to the untrained eye i mean this kind of looks like an egg and that's not really what we want. We'll get into angles in just a second. And finally, sitting there way too friggin' long. So aluminum is great at dissipating heat, but it will hit its point of maximum saturation. And that basically means this sucker melted down. So we can't sit there forever. We actually have to see our quarter inch or six millimeter reflective weld pool. And that's the point where we can actually get moving when we start to actually weld it, right? So if we sit there forever, it's just gonna be this big blob of hot snot. Now, these are the two biggest problems. Actually, one, two, three are the biggest problems that we have, right? Too high of a torch height. It's very hard to define the weld pool at that point. So make sure your torch height is close, not too close, and don't sit there forever. Once you get it, don't just sit there and watch it. Remember, you are the one who's in control. So once you have filled up enough of these and you're comfortable with continuously repeating that quarter inch or six millimeter diameter weld pool that is reflective and you have a result that looks something like this, then you can start moving on. And that's what we're gonna do right now. Right, now that we've got that done, let's move on to another exercise. This one is all about control of the weld pool as we traverse our part. Now you need to get yourself obviously in your comfortable position, wherever that might be. And then we're gonna start just inward or inboard of the edge of the coupon, right? Don't start on the edge because then it's probably gonna crack on you. So we wanna focus just a little bit inboard, keep the torch as close as possible. Give yourself a bit of a practice swing, right? You can slide your hand if you want, but that's actually kind of relatively intermediate. Uh, I mean, it, the thing is, is a lot of people, they, they tense up when they do that. So if you're literally, if you're all blotchy and you're, you're like this or whatever, you're probably too tense and you need to, you need to kind of you know, think about well, maybe I should just move a little bit with my fingers, right? Because realistically, this coupon's four inches wide, right? 100 millimeters or so, right? We're gonna start inboard and we're gonna terminate inboard, meaning that we're not gonna go all the way to the edge of one side or the other. You only have to go, what, three and a half inches or so? What is that, like 90 millimeters or, no, that's it's like 80 millimeters, 80, 85, whatever, screw it. We just need to be able to, tra to traverse this part, keep the torch at the same relative height all the way throughout. We don't wanna, we don't wanna lift it up. We wanna make sure that we have clean line of sight on the part the whole way through right so if i start here and i terminate here i can see the tip of the tungsten in relation to the coupon all i'm going to do is stare at that width of that weld pool and i'm going to control it right now there's two ways that we can control this one of them is going to be my speed the other one is going to be my amperage but no matter what all i'm looking is at the width of that weld pool and i'm trying to make sure that i sustain it i maintain it i keep it that way and remember you are the one who's in control of this thing so if you see it start to get really wide fix it the way you fix it is either speed up or take your foot off the pedal slowly until you see a change in that weld pool now let's just see what one looks like normal a, a correct a controlled exercise here right so we'll initiate the arc i'm not going to take too long but there's my quarter inch weld pool and all i'm going to do is maintain it I'm gonna keep the torch at the same relative height. And I'm just gonna move along here. And ideally I wanna keep that weld pool a quarter inch or six millimeters in width. I'm gonna stop a little bit before I hit the end. Bingo. If you have a crater, don't worry about it. And I'm gonna tell you don't worry about it because we're not adding filler right now. So that's fine. Now the result of this, it's shiny, it's nice. We have a clean and uniform etching zone around the edge of the coupon. When I say it's clean and uniform, that means that it looks the exact same all the way throughout. If it's like white and ashy and blotchy and speckly and stuff like that, then that would indicate that you're not enough amps. You didn't commit to it, or you had way too high of a torch height, or you had a contaminated tungsten. You notice that there are several things, right? It's not just one, it's several, right? So we did the first one. Let's do another one right over the top of that. This time, the coupon is already a little bit hotter, so it's not gonna take as much amperage to get moving on it. So I'm choosing to substitute with speed. So as I'm going through this, it's a little bit quicker. Now, even though I went quicker, I got the exact same result, right? So again, that's one way of it. You can control it with speed, or you can control it with your amperage, right? Now, I've welded this twice, it's already hot. It's really hot. So I'm gonna weld it again, or I'm gonna make another 
uh, run here, another puddle run, if you will, right? But this time I'm gonna do, I'm gonna substitute with amperage. I'm gonna have just a little bit less amps and I'm gonna go a little bit slower. But ideally here, we're gonna make this the exact same width. I wanna get the exact same result. And again, all I'm paying attention to right now is the width of that weld pool. It's a quarter inch in diameter, my weld pool is reflective, and I'm gonna maintain it. Now, this is not my normal way of maintaining a weld pool. So forgive me if it looks a little bit awkward. But there we go. All three of these look relatively the same. Like there's almost no difference in them, right? We still have that clean quarter inch width of a weld pool all the way across. Our etching zone looks the exact same all the way across. All three of these results are shiny all the way across. We're not worried about ripples and none of that stuff. We're not gonna pedal pulse. We're not doing any of that crap. You notice I just, all I did was maintain the width of that weld pool. Again, two ways to do that. One, your speed. Two, your amps, as in your foot pedal position, right? Those are the only two ways to control this. And you gotta figure out which one's gonna work for you. Now, I should throw in a little bit of a caveat there. If you smash the pedal to the floor and you fly through it that quick, think, are you gonna be able to add filler wire accurately that quick? And the answer is probably no. So you have to find a realistic speed to which to work with this, right? So we'll take a few of these coupons, we'll fill them up, and we'll just keep on going and going and going until we have consistent results all the way across, that no matter what temperature this is at, you can still control it and still get the exact same result. That's what we're trying to do here. Get the same result out of every single one of these. So let's take a look here at some improper results, right? First and foremost, we're just running way too hot. Now, hot, again, is a couple of different things. This was the first weld on a Daisy Fresh cold coupon, right? But hot would mean that we're not moving fast enough or we've got way too many amps for the speed that we're running at. In other words, this weld pool is not a quarter inch in diameter or six millimeters by contrast, right, or comparison here. This is way too big, right? What we need to do is control it. We need to be able to either speed up or let off of our foot pedal. If it's burning this wide, it's because we said, I want you to burn this wide, right? So that's too hot. And again, two ways you can control that. It's either too, too little of a speed for the amps you have or not enough amps for the speed you have, which looks like this, right? Notice that this just is uh, pretty much an all etchy, it's just all you see is etching zone. There's no definition of a weld pool itself. Again, by comparison, these are nice and shiny, right? This is not. This is what we called a puddle-shaped shiny spot, which is just enough of oxide layer that's broken, but not actually creating a pool. So if you have no definition or it's something like this, then that's a no-no, that's a no-go. We can't use that, right? Then we move on to not controlling our amps. So we started out with a good quarter inch or six millimeter diameter weld pool and we maintained it except we were going too slow and not controlling it. In other words, it just started melting, 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 getting bigger, 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 bigger until it was finally point of no return. The solution here, if you see it's starting to get wider as we go, you need to either speed up or let off your amps. Again, this is a control exercise. Uh, you, want to, you want to be able to actually keep the diameter of that weld pool. So that's to say is if you started here and you saw it get bigger, you were not maintaining it. So again, either speed up or reduce your amps. If you see this happen, you told it to do that. You are the one who's in the control of the machine. It's not in your settings. It's not in anything else like that. It's control. It's because you failed to control it. A pulser will not fix this. Pedal pulsing with the foot, that's not gonna fix this. You fix this by either speeding up or let off your amps, right? Now we get into ramping. So we started out really good, but as the torch height came up, it started splaying outward. It started to project the, the arc and the cone all over the place until we finally pretty much lost definition right here. And by this time, it was so huge that it basically just melted it away. So if you see it starting out pretty good and then you see it start to oxidize and get kind of crappy and look like it's got like a peel layer over it, like melted plastic, if you will, then you definitely have an issue with your torch height. Now. Let's talk about the torch height being a little too close. Here we have a quarter inch in diameter, but you notice it was cutting out every single time we, you know, it was the machine's literally just stopping. It's like, ee, 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 ee. that's Morse code for lift up the torch a little bit too, a little bit more. You're, you're way too close. So anytime you see the arc cutting out or you hear it or you see it or it shuts off, that's because you touched it, right? So you have to pick it up and maintain it, right? But when you pick it up, you can't go too high. Otherwise you're gonna get something like this, right? 
Finally, welding with a contaminated tungsten. That was after we took it for a swim, like, what is that, like 28 times? But either way, the etching zone around here is very blotchy, right? It's not, it's not as clean and crisp as this, right? See, this etching zone right here is nice and clean. It's the same, it's uniform all the way around. This in the beginning here is not. And there's not a lot of definition of that weld pool because the arc is spraying everywhere. It's trying to find anything it can. The etching zone is huge. The definition is crappy. We can't really say that this is a weld pool or it's not. So I was forced to either hit the amps or let off or whatever the case is, but I could get no definition out of the weld pool. So if you can't quite see what it is that you're doing, you might also have a contaminated tungsten. Now this is just six examples. And literally there are hundreds of other examples that we could show you here in a billion different results. Everything from gas flow issues to, you know, contaminated tungstens, dirty metal, I mean, all kinds of stuff, right? There's, there's so much that goes on here. But at the end of the day, once again, this is a control exercise. If you can't maintain the consistency of that weld pool or the width of that weld pool, you shouldn't be moving on. So everything about this is just controlling your speed or the amps that you have coming out of it, your pedal position, right? So once you have this with no other aid or crutch or anything else like that, no pulser, no pedal pulsing, no friggin' blotchiness, once you get it nice and clean and even, then you can actually move on. This is just a handful of ways that it doesn't work. So once you have that exercise pretty much all set and you're, you're done, you figured it out, you're good to go, now it's time to add some filler wire. Now. I can't stress this enough that this is literally the exact same exercise that we've been doing this entire time regarding control. We're still going to maintain a quarter inch or a six millimeter diameter of a weld pool all the way across. The filler is going to get added to the leading edge of the weld pool. Now to really define what the leading edge is, that's going forward, okay? Forward is the direction of the filler. The leading edge is the front tip in the direction of forward, right? So if you're right-handed, you're gonna weld from right to left in the direction of the filler. If you're left-handed, you're gonna weld from left to right in the direction of the filler. And the filler gets introduced to just the little tip of the weld pool, okay? We're not, gonna, we're not gonna pick up the torch to insert filler. We're not gonna put the filler next to the weld pool or anything like that. We're not gonna stab it down on the top. We're not gonna stuff a bunch of filler in there. All we're gonna do is take the very tip of that filler and touch it to the leading edge. And whatever wicks off, provided that we have the correct uh, control over our weld pool, whatever wicks off is just gonna stack there in the back and fill all in automatically. Maybe that's something you didn't know. We're not trying to stuff anything in here. We're just gonna drop it in there. Now to traverse this part, four to six inches or 100 to 150 millimeters, that's all you need. Do not worry about feeding filler wire if you never have before. There is a natural evolution to feeding filler and it's, 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 it's actually a lot more complicated than people realize. Everybody wants to be able to do this out of the gate. And of course, you know, I've seen all the videos and the, you know, of course I've mentioned, you know, muscle memory is good. You could, you know, you could try to work this, but when you're actually here in the beginning, don't worry about it. Just give yourself four to six inches or 100 to 150 millimeters. This coupon's only, you know, four inches wide, less than 100 millimeters. We're at, what, 80, 85 millimeters or so is all we're gonna traverse, right? We're gonna start inboard and we're gonna terminate inboard. We're not gonna go all the way to the edges because it, it'll crack, right? So just starting there, Finishing there, I've got good line of sight all the way through, just like I did before. The filler wire is going into the leading edge. We're just gonna tap it in there. And as soon as we go in, we gotta come back out, right? It's not gonna stay there. We're not gonna lazy lay wire this thing over the top of it. Because if you do that, you're, you're just gonna halt yourself, right? So leading edge, tap it in, bring it back out. All of the movement is in my fingertips. Very, very simple. I'm not gonna be tensed up, I'm gonna be loose just like I had before. You know, comfort's a relatively loose term, but if you notice very carefully, the filler is held the exact same as I hold the torch. It's literally just mirrored of that. So between my two fingers, my middle finger and my index finger, and then the rest of it, just like the torch, rests on my perlicue. And it sits just the way that my torch hand does. Filler goes here, torch hand goes there, not tensed up. We're not gonna be like, you know, trying to get through there. We're just gonna literally create our weld pool. And as soon as we have a quarter inch or six millimeter in diameter, tap that leading edge. And all I'm doing is maintaining the width of the weld pool, just like I did before. The filler is more peripheral. It's just there, just like the torch is peripheral. We're not staring at that. We're just concentrating on the leading edge of that weld pool, right? 
all you gotta do. So let's go one round here. Start this sucker up. All right, quarter inch, six millimeters. Let's start moving. Now again, all I'm doing is concentrating on the leading edge of that weld pool. I don't care about the filler, where it's at, or anything else like that. And I'm just touching it, just a little tap in that leading edge. Torch height staying consistent and steady, same height. I'm coming up to the end, so I'm going to back out of my amp, and I'm going to reverse the torch. I'm going to move the torch backwards a little bit, okay? The reason why I do that, and you, you know what? Let me just tell you flat out, don't worry if you got a crater in the end of it, all right? I know everybody's like, the internet will tear you apart. I mean, you've got a crater, but look, you're just practicing on flat metal coupons, just doing some flat beads. Forget it if you have a crater, but if you wanna try to avoid the crater, a little extra dab and back up, as in move the torch backwards as you're tapering off or slowly removing your foot from the pedal. And as soon as you're done, of course, take your foot completely off again, right? Now, you notice I wasn't pushing, I wasn't stabbing, I was gliding across this coupon, just tapping it in there, and of course, the same amount of filler, or my hand is in the exact same spot that the filler was before. So, that's how you make one bead. We're just concentrating on the width of the weld pool and just tapping into the leading edge, right? So, let's go again. Four to six inches, or 100 to 150 millimeters. Watch my hands this time. They're not going to move. This hand is going to move. My torch hand will, but my filler hand is not. But same rules apply every single time. I'm gonna go a little bit faster this time. And then we'll taper off. There we go. I did miss a couple of dabs, no big deal, right? We'll do the same thing again. This time I'm gonna go a little bit slower. I went fast last time because I was compensating for speed. That's why I missed a couple dabs. My accuracy kind of went out the window. So again, four to six inches, 100 to 150 millimeters. I'm gonna go a little bit slower this time around. But still, I gotta maintain the width of that weld pool, which is a quarter inch or six millimeters. This is a lot slower than I'm used to going. But since I'm going slower, I back off my amp. Whatever it takes to keep that weld pool at a, at, a, at a quarter inch or six millimeters, that's what I'm gonna do. And toward the end here, I got just a little bit wide. I was talking more than paying attention, but you know what, that happens. Nevertheless, these three beads were done using the exact same principle, the exact same exercise that we started with as you know, throughout this whole video. We're just maintaining. So let's recap again here, quarter inch, to or six millimeters of a diameter of a weld pool. The speed is up to how fast I can accurately add the filler wire. The torch and the filler wire are peripheral. They, I can see them peripherally, right? There, there's ones over you know, here on the other side and this one's over here. They're still in that, that field of vision, that view right there, but they're, you know, they're gonna go to the same place. We're just gonna tap the leading edge of the weld pool, not push, not stuff, not stab, not tense up, not, you know, grrr, you know let's make some stuff happen. All we're doing this entire time, no matter what we're doing, if we're adding filler, if we're traversing, if we're sitting still, we're just controlling the width of that weld pool. That's it. So give me one second here and let me turn off the machine because I decided I'm gonna do a couple of welds that, well, you should be looking out for. Let's just put it that way, right? We'll even throw our tungsten out here. That way you can see exactly what we're doing, right? These are several welds. Actually, there's four of them that are very, very common here of what not to do. And if you take a look at them, you can actually distinctly tell the difference. Now, this big, long weld down the middle. Let's take a look at that first. The uniformity on it is pretty good. I mean, as far as like, you know, the stack dimes or whatever the case is, right? Again, we're never going to worry about stacking dimes. We don't really care about that. We just happen to make welds that look good. So if your uniformity is not perfect on your bead profile, don't worry about it. You've got so much time to practice all this and it's gonna take years for you to get this down right anyway. So nevertheless, we're shiny. We've got a good crown on here. 
The toes are the section where the metal or the bead meets the base metal. And in this case, you can kind of run the filler over it and it's, it's smooth, right? It's not, it's not a big uh, wall, if you will, indicating that we didn't have a huge, you know, high build bead profile. And again, I must you know, emphasize here that all of this was just tapping the weld, uh, the wire into the leading edge of the weld pool. It was wicking off of it. I was not pushing wire in there to make it stack. I was just dropping it in place, if you will, right? So this is our control bead and it's still, you know, quarter inch width relatively. Uh, the etching zone around it is nice and uniform. We don't have any blotchiness or anything else like that. So this is our control. This is what we're after. And there was nothing special to make this happen. Just the same exercise that we've been running for the last who knows how many minutes now. This is way too friggin' cold. And I mean extremely friggin' cold, as in there was no weld pool. You could see as I'm running along here, I'm just melting filler and it's sticking to the top of it. That's effectively what we, uh, it's about the same consistency as solder. So if you see this, you know, the toes are kind of blotchy, little speckles everywhere. The uh, etching zone or whatever is not uniform. It's, it's like kind of jagged looking. And of course, it's extremely clumpy, right? And it's kind of hazy, you know, uh, ashy, if you will, right? That's, that's just way too cold. But contrast that to still being too cold, right? This kind of looks shiny and relatively uniform. I mean, the etching zone around it also looks kind of relatively uniform. But if I push on it with the filler, you see I got some resistance. That's a very high build profile. That would be a lack of penetration uh, to get that, right? So if it looks a little ashy and it's a really high build after just doing these exercises, then you know you're too cold, right? Contrast that with being way too friggin' hot. So what happened here is I took forever to get started. The weld pool started, when I started traversing and adding filler, the weld pool was already past that diameter of a quarter inch or six millimeters, which means if I don't correct it, it's gonna stay that way, and if I really don't correct it, it's only going to get worse, which is what happened here. So ideally, if you run into that situation, you gotta correct it, right? Don't just watch the thing fall apart fix it. You are the one who's in control of this machine, right? So if you're getting that, you're way too hot. That has nothing to do with your amperage as in the number you dialed onto the machine. That has to do with how long you were sitting there in relation to your foot pedal or your travel speed. In this case, too much foot pedal, too low of a speed. Finally, we got the good old fashioned Q-tip. Now take a look at the tip of my tungsten here. That is filler wire. What happened is we were starting to move pretty nice and everything was good until oops, I smashed the friggin' filler right into the tungsten and it started going just absolutely crazy. And it actually did shock me twice. That one, that one stung a little bit. But nevertheless, if you ever look at a weld and you see all of this black, messed up, burnt up area, there's only one way to get that. And that is with hitting the Q-tip on there. That's by sending the filler straight into the actual tungsten instead of into the weld pool. So if you ever see a weld that looks like this, don't keep welding it. You gotta clean all of this crap off of the tip of the tungsten. Every single bit of this has to go away afterwards, right? So make sure that you clean all of that back off, resharpen or switch your tungsten out, whatever the case is. Sometimes you have to cut this end off because it contaminates so far up the tungsten, depending on how bad you Q-tipped it. I mean, we have some records at the shop from people in the classes. This is, this is kind of modest, to be honest with you, but sometimes you gotta cut it off, but either way, you have to have clean metal. If you ever see this result, there is only one way to get it, and that is with the Q-tip. So realize that not one single bit of any of this that we worked on right here, not one single bit had anything to do with settings. We didn't use the pulser. We didn't try to make a pretty bead. What we did was follow three very simple exercises and drills, which is control your weld pool. And at the end of the day, no matter what it is that you're working on, all you're doing is concentrating on that weld pool and controlling it. That's the whole point of this. There's no setting in the world that's gonna make this happen. There's no setting in the world that's going to not make this happen. There's no setting that's gonna avoid any of this stuff. It's all you, so get your butt out there, grab yourself some metal from weldmetalsonline.com, practice these drills, and I hope to see you guys on Weld With Me Live.